He and Thorir had each offered three marks of silver as a bounty for the head of Krons. This was an uncommon amount, as previously no more than three marks had ever been offered for a bounty. Snorri warned that it was a foolish endeavour to attempt to keep an outlaw like Krones away, who could cause great harm, and many would be impacted. They parted ways, and the men rode home from the meeting. Krones journeyed over the Thorskafjord heath and arrived at Langadal. He wasted no time in surveying the land of the humble cultivators, taking what he pleased from each. From some he collected weapons, and from others, clothes. Although the people gave up their possessions in various ways, after Krons had left, they all claimed to have had no choice but to comply. Vermund the Slender, brother of Viga Stier, lived in Fattensfjord. He was married to Thorbjorg, the daughter of Olaf Peacock, son of Hoskuld, famously known as Thorbjorg the Fat. When Krons visited Langadal, Vermund was at the thing. Krons crossed the ridge to Laugabol, where Helgi, one of the principal bondis, lived. There, Krons helped himself to a good horse belonging to the bondi, and rode on to Gervidal. At Gervidal, Krons took what he wanted from Thorkel, who lacked the courage to resist. Krons's journey continued to the coast of the fjord, where he received food and clothes from every homestead. People found it troublesome to live their lives while he was around. Driven by his audacity, Krons continued until he reached Vatsfjardardal, where he entered a dairy shelter and stayed for several nights. He slept in the forest without any fear. When the shepherds became aware of the situation, they reported it to the homesteads. The farmers came together, and a group of thirty concealed themselves in the forest, where Krons could not find them. They set one of the shepherds to watch for an opportunity to seize Krons, not knowing who he was. One day, when Krons was asleep, the farmers approached him. They planned how to capture him without harming themselves, and decided that ten of them should attack him, while the others bound his feet. They threw themselves at him, but Krons fought back so vehemently that he threw them off and landed on his hands and knees. They bound Krons tightly with ropes that dug into his skin, causing him to writhe in pain. Yet, despite his predicament, he managed to daze two of his captors with well-placed kicks to the ears. Breathing heavily, Krons braced himself for the next onslaught. It came quicker than he expected, but he fought valiantly nonetheless. Eventually, though, the prying hands overwhelmed him and secured him in unyielding bonds. As they stood over him, panting, the bondis wondered aloud about what to do with the troublesome captive. Helgi of Laugabol was the first to decline the task of guarding Krons, citing his pressing duties elsewhere. Thorkel of Gervidal echoed this sentiment, insisting that his humble dwelling lacked the proper accommodations. It seemed like nobody wanted the burden of Krons. The Bondis consulted each other until they came to a consensus. Krons must be hanged. The mere thought of it brought joy to their faces, and they wasted no time in raising a gallows in the nearby forest. They were jubilant at the prospect of finally ridding themselves of the prickly problem that Krons posed. They were still laughing and celebrating when they looked down the valley and saw three figures riding towards them. One of them, a person in a dyed dress, stood out. It could only be Thorbjorg, the mistress of Fattensfjord. She was a woman of great importance, as well as an esteemed sage. She was a prominent figure in the district, and in Vermund's absence she took charge of everything. As she rode up to where the crowd had gathered, she was lifted off her horse, and the Bondies respectfully saluted her. With a commanding presence, she asked what the meeting was about, and who the thick-necked man in bonds was. Krons introduced himself and saluted her back. She wanted to know what had led Krons to resort to violence against her thing-men. Krons replied that he could not turn a blind eye to everything he saw, and that he had to do something. With a wry smile, she remarked that Krons was unfortunate to be captured by a pack of churls, and not a worthy adversary, and to have escaped punishment. She asked the Bondis what they intended to do with Krons, and they replied that they were going to hang him. She cautioned them against taking the life of a man as renowned and well-connected as Krons, even if he was ill-starred. She offered Krons a chance to save his life by making him swear never to commit any violence in Isafjord, and to refrain from seeking vengeance against those who had captured him. Krons agreed to her terms, and he was released. Krons admitted that it was difficult not to lash out at the men who were openly mocking him. Grateful for Thorbjorg's mercy, he accepted her offer to stay with her in Fattensfjord until Vermund returned. Thorbjorg's act of compassion earned her great renown in the district. When Vermund returned and learned of Krons's release, he was curious about Thorbjorg's reasoning. 
Thorbjorg offered three reasons for her mercy. First, that he might be respected as a chief for having a wife brave enough to spare a man's life. Second, that Kronz's kinswoman, Hrefna, would likely be grateful to her for saving his life. And third, that Kronz was a man of high worth in many respects. You are a woman of great wisdom, he said with gratitude. I thank you for all that you have done. Turning to Kronz, he continued, You are a man of great strength and ability, and yet you sold yourself cheap to those churls who captured you. Such is the fate of those who cannot control themselves. In response, Kronz recited a verse, My cup was full in Isafjord, when the old swine held me captive. Curious, Vermund asked, What did they plan to do with you when they captured you? To Sigar's destiny my neck was bound, but noble Thorbjorg intervened, replied Kronz. Would they have hung you if left to their own devices? Vermund asked again. Without her intervention my neck would have been in a noose, Kronz explained. Did she invite you to her home? Vermund asked about Thorbjorg. She did, and with it she gave me a steed, as well as life and peace, Kronz replied. You have learned to beware of your foes, but your life will be great and troubled, Vermund warned. I cannot keep you here, for many powerful men will become your enemies if I do. The best course of action is to seek your kin, though it won't be easy as not many will take you in. And you, Kronz, have never been one to easily follow the will of another man. Kronz stayed in Fattensfjord for a time before travelling to the western fjords to seek refuge with several notable figures. However, something always occurred to prevent his acceptance. During autumn, Kronz journeyed to the south and continued until he reached his relative Thorstein Kjalanes in Liarskoga. Thorstein extended a warm welcome to Kronz and offered him to stay for the winter. Thorstein was a diligent man and ran a large smithy, employing several men. However, Kronz was not someone who enjoyed hard work, so their personalities did not always align. Thorstein had constructed a church on his territory, with a unique bridge leading to his home, which displayed great skill and imagination. The bridge had rings and bells attached on the beams that resonated to Skurfstadir, half a sea mile away, whenever someone walked over it. The bridge project had demanded significant effort for Thorstein, who excelled in working with iron. Kronz was an expert blacksmith himself, but generally lacked the motivation to apply himself to labor. The winter passed by calmly, and the only notable event was when the men of Hrutafjord learned of Kronz's presence in Thorstein's home and decided to act in the spring. Consequently, Thorstein informed Kronz that he must seek shelter elsewhere, since laziness didn't coincide with his values. Kronz inquired, Where do you suggest I go? Thorstein instructed Kronz to journey south to his relatives, but to return if he found them to be of no use. Kronz complied and travelled to Borgarfjord in the south, where he stayed with Grim, Thorhal's son, during the thing. Grim then guided him to Skapti the lawman at Yali, and Kronz continued his journey across the lower heaths, and paused nowhere until he reached Tunga, where he visited Thorhall, the son of Asgrim and Elidegrim. Kronz paid little attention to the neighbouring farms, and Thorhall learned about Kronz through their family connections. Kronz's reputation was renowned in the country owing to his accomplishments. Thorhall treated him with respect, but was not eager to keep him for an extended period. Kronz travelled up the Haukadal Valley, away from Tonga, towards Kjol, where he spent the summer. However, the journey was fraught with danger, as travellers were often robbed of what they carried. Kronz found himself struggling to make a living. One day, while north of Dufuneskid, Kronz spotted a man riding south through the Kjol Valley. He was a tall figure on horseback, leading another horse loaded with sacks. The man had a slouched hat covering his face, making it difficult to identify him. Kronz was delighted to see the horses and belongings that the stranger was carrying. He approached the man and asked for his name. The man replied, My name is Lopt. You must be Kronz the Strong, son of Averoy. Where are you heading? I have not yet decided, Kronz responded. For now I want to know if you have any goods you're willing to part with. Why should I give you my belongings for free? What can you offer me in return? asked Lopt. Don't you know that I never pay anything? Yet I always get what I want, replied Kronz arrogantly. Lopt retorted, You can make that offer to someone else. I won't give away my possessions for free. Let's go our separate ways. As he began to ride away, Kronz grabbed Lopt's horse bridle, causing a struggle between the two men. Lopt fought fiercely to keep his possessions, eventually managing to wrench the bridle from Kronz's hands. Kronz was amazed by Lopt's strength, and after regaining his composure, asked, Where are you off to now? He said, 
I ride to the storm-driven den, across ice-clad heights, to the rock and the hand's resting place, Lopt replied. Kronz, baffled by the enigmatic response, prodded for clarity, to which Lopt replied, I seek not to hide the path to Borgferdings, where Baljokel calls home. They parted ways after a moment of tense silence, and Kronz, ruefully aware of his lack of leverage, recited a verse. Ilugi brave and Atli were far. Never again may such misfortunes happen to me. The reins were torn from my grasp. Her tears will flow when fear takes hold. Despondent and defenseless, Kronz made his way south to Yali to seek shelter from Skapti. However, Skapti was hesitant to harbor an alleged thief and suggested that Kronz abandon his illegal ways. As a lawman of the country, Skapti could not compromise his integrity. Kronz, expressing his fear of the dark and reluctance to be alone, beseeched Skapti for empathy. Skapti remained firm in his resolve, warning Kronz of the perils of trust and advising caution. Kronz, grateful for Skapti's counsel, made his way back to Borgarfjord in the autumn and consulted his friend Grim, son of Thorhall. He shared his plight with Grim, who suggested that he seek refuge in Fiskevorten in the Arnartven Heath. With a renewed sense of purpose, Kronz ventured northward in search of a sanctuary. Kronz ascended the Arnarvatten Heath, setting out to build himself a shelter in search of a more honourable livelihood than thievery. The remnants of his humble abode remain standing to this day. Battling with a fear of the dark in the mountains, Kronz found solace in fishing by the shore to provide for his needs. Word soon spread of Kronz's presence, catching the attention of other outlaws who saw the potential for him to lend them protection. One such outlaw hailed from the north and went by the name Grimm. Intrigued by the bounty attached to Kronz, Grimm was tempted by those of Hrutafjord to eliminate him, offering pardon and riches in return. Grimm presented himself at Kronz's door, revealing his deepest intentions. Seeking a companion to work alongside him, Kronz begrudgingly accepted Grimm in his home. The two lived together through the winter months, but Kronz remained vigilant, keeping his weapons close and never letting his guard down. One day Grimm attempted to strike Kronz as he lay in bed, believing him to be asleep. With sword in hand he sneaked up to the bed, ready to attack. However, as soon as he raised his blade, Kronz sprang up and overpowered Grimm, revealing him as the traitor he truly was. Your false friendship has cost you dearly, Kronz stated coldly. He eventually coerced the complete truth from him before executing him. It taught him a valuable lesson about harboring a wild man from the forest. The winter season progressed, and the most difficult aspect to endure was his fright of the absence of light. Thorir of Gard had learned where Kronz had taken up residence, and was determined to take him down. He sought out Thorir Redbeard, a tough and skilled fighter who had been outlawed throughout the land. Thorir of Gard offered to remove Redbeard's outlaw status, and provide him with plenty of coins if he could slay Kronz. Redbeard agreed to the task, but warned it would not be easy. Kronz was known for his vigilance and caution. Thorir instructed Redbeard on how to approach Kronz, and then sent him on his way to the east, so that Kronz would not suspect where he came from. Redbeard eventually arrived at Arnarvatten Heath, where Kronz had been residing for the winter. He requested hospitality, but Kronz was hesitant to allow any more strangers in after a man had betrayed him the previous autumn. Thorir spoke up, assuring Kronz that he was not like the treacherous forest men he had encountered before. He convinced Kronz to give him a chance, promising he had no ill intentions. Kronz relented, but warned Thorir that any deceit would result in death, and so the stage was set for Redbeard to take down Kronz. Thorir Redbeard had been with Kronz on the heath for two long years. Kronz had taken Thorir in, and it quickly became clear that Thorir had the strength of two men. Whatever Kronz asked him to do, Thorir was ready and willing. Kronz had never lived so comfortably since becoming an outlaw, for Thorir did everything he needed. But Thorir was always on guard, and he knew that Kronz was watching him. He needed to find a way to take Kronz off his guard. One night in the spring, a heavy gale blew in while they were sleeping. Kronz woke up and asked where their boat was. Thorir sprang up, ran to the boat, broke it into pieces, and threw the fragments around so that it looked as if the storm had wrecked it. Then he returned to the hut and said aloud, You have had bad luck, my friend. Our boat is all broken into pieces, and the nets are lying far out in the lake. Get them back then, said Kronz. It seems to me that it's your doing that the boat is smashed. Of all things that I can do, said Thorir, swimming is that which suits me the least. In almost anything else, 
I think I can hold my own with any ordinary man. You know very well that I have been no burden to you since I came here, nor would I ask you to do this if I were able to do it myself. Kronz then arose, took his arms, and went to the lake. There was a point of land running out into the lake with a large bay on the further side of it. The water was deep up to the shore. Kronz said, Swim out to the nets and let me see what you are able to do. I told you before, Thorir said, that I cannot swim. I do not know now where all your boldness and daring are gone. I could get the nets, he said, but betray me not if I trust you. Do not think such shameful and monstrous things of me, said Thorir. You will prove yourself what you are, Kron said. He shed his garments and weapons, plunging into the rushing water to retrieve the tangled nets. With skilled hands he gathered the webbing and made his way back to the sandy shore, heaving the bounty onto the bank with a grunt of exertion. Yet his peaceful labor was disrupted by the sound of a blade being unsheathed. Thorir, a fierce competitor, charged towards him, fury etched into his features. But Kronz was quick, and as Thorir swung his sword towards him, he deftly fell back, plummeting into the cool waves below. He swam silently, staying close to the shore as to avoid detection from his foe. With ease, he slipped past Thorir's watchful gaze, reaching the bay behind him undetected. Without warning, Kronz lifted Thorir high above his head with a solitary, impressive motion. The warrior's body was thrown to the ground with such strength that the sword flew from his grip. In a final moment of mercy, Kronz lifted the blade and, without uttering a single word, brought it down upon Thorir's head. After that, Kronz chose to live alone, shunning any other forest dwellers. Though in his heart he yearned for companionship, he could not bring himself to trust anyone again after such betrayal. At the All Thing assembly, Thorir of Gard received word that Thorir Redbeard had met his end. The news was not easily dealt with, and Thorir of Gard decided to ride westward through the lower heath with the help of about eighty men to avenge Redbeard's death by taking Kronz's life. However, Grim, the son of Thorhall, caught wind of the plan and warned Kronz to be on guard. Kronz was vigilant in watching the comings and goings of any men in the area. One day, Kronz spotted a group of men heading in the direction of his dwelling. He retreated into a gorge between two rocks, but did not flee completely, because he did not see the entire group of men. It was then that Thorir arrived with his whole party, commanding his men to surround Kronz, saying the scoundrel had no chance now. Kronz was undeterred, he said. A filled cup is not yet drunk. You have come far to seek me, and some of you shall bear the marks of our game before we part. Thorir urged his men on to attack, but the gorge was so narrow that Kronz could easily defend it from one end. Thorir's men fell and were wounded. Thorir was surprised that his men could not get around Kronz's rear to harm him. As the battle continued, Thorir exclaimed, I always heard that Kronz was distinguished for his courage and daring, but I never knew that he was so skilled in magic as I now see he is, for there fall half as many again behind his back as before his face, and I see that we have to do with a troll instead of a man. With that, Thorir ordered his men to retreat. Kronz, exhausted but bewildered, wondered what had just occurred. Thorir and his followers withdrew and rode off to the north, leaving eighteen men on the ground and several more wounded. Their expedition was widely regarded as a disgrace. Kronz ascended the gorge and stumbled upon a man with massive proportions reclining against the stone, grievously wounded. Kronz inquired about the man's identity, to which he replied, I am Halmund. You may remember me as the man who held the reins tightly when we crossed paths in Kjol the previous summer. I trust I have now proven my worthiness. Truly, Kronz replied, you have rendered me a great service. I shall repay it whenever possible. May you come to my home then, Halmond requested. Lingering on the heath must be tiresome for you. Kronz eagerly agreed, and they journeyed together towards the base of the Baljokul, where Halmond possessed an extensive cavern. Within they found his daughter, a comely and well-built young woman. They treated Kronz with kindness and hospitality and his wounds, as well as Halman's, were tended to by the daughter until they were both restored to health. Kronz tarried in the cave that summer, and it was during this time that he composed an ode celebrating Halmond. Halmond steps from his mountain hall, and further, the war fane sword in Arnarvatten went forth to hew its bloody path. Heroes inherit Kelduverfi. Halmond the brave came forth from his den. Reportedly during their meeting, Kronz killed six men while Halmond killed twelve. As the summer drew to a close, Kronz began yearning for civilization and the company of his friends and kinfolk. Halmond bade him to visit again when he returned to the south, and Kronz promised to do so. 
he set out westward to Borgafjord, and then to Breidaf Yardardalir, seeking counsel from Thorstein Kjallanes about his next destination. Thorstein warned that Krons had accumulated too many enemies, but recommended he journey to Myrar and survey the location. So in the autumn, he ventured towards Myrar. Chapter 14. The Search for Sanctuary In the village of Holm lived an infamous warrior known as Draugur the Hitdale. He was the descendant of a long line of powerful and fearless men, including Arngir, Bersi the Godless, and Balki, the first settler in Hlutafjord. Draugur was highly respected among his people, not just for his strength and bravery, but also for his willingness to help those in need. When Krons, a former kinsman, came to Holm seeking shelter, Draugr did not hesitate to offer his protection. However, Draugr knew that Krons had many enemies and quarrels throughout the land, and harboring him could potentially put him and his people at risk of being outlawed. So he struck a deal with Krons. He would give him shelter and help him out. But in return, Krons must leave the men under Draugr's protection alone. Krons agreed to the terms, and Draugr had an idea. He told Krons about a mountain near the Hitara River, which had a strategic spot for defence and hiding. There was a hole in the mountain that overlooked a high road, and a steep slope leading down to it. Draugr suggested that Krons could make his home there and defend it against any attackers. Krons took Draugr's advice and made himself a home on top of the mountain. He hung some grey wadmal in front of the hole to make it appear as if someone could look through it, but in reality it was just a clever disguise. Krons began to gather his supplies, and while the Myramen thought he was just an unhappy visitor, he was actually preparing for something bigger. Draugr had an ongoing feud with Thord, the son of Kolbein, a poet who lived nearby. Draugr saw an opportunity to use Krons to his advantage and asked him to keep an eye on Thord's men and cattle. Krons and Draugr spent a lot of time together and played many games of strength. The story of Draugr and Krons might seem like a simple tale of two men helping each other out, but it was much more than that. It was a story of loyalty, bravery and cunning, and a testament to the resilience and resourcefulness of the Icelandic people. Draugr's saga tells us that the strength of Krons and Draugr was seen as equal, but it is commonly believed that Krons was the mightiest person to roam the land since the days that Orin Storolfsson and Thoralf Skolmsson put their strength to the test. Krons and Draugr swam together through the entire length of Hitara, from the lake at the source to the sea. The stepping stones they established in the river have remained unmoved by floods, freezing and ice drifts ever since. Krons was able to hold his position in Fagraskogafjal for a whole year without anybody daring to challenge him. Despite this, numerous people lost their property to him without receiving anything in return. Krons was able to do this because he had a strong defensive position and was always in good relationships with those who were near him. Once there was a man named Gisli, son of Thorstein, who had been killed by Snorri the Godi. Gisli was a strapping lad, always preening in his flashy clothes and armour, full of himself and his own accomplishments. He made his living as a sailor and had just landed at Havita River after spending a winter in the mountains. As he was setting up shop, Thord, son of Kolbein, rode to his ship to say hello. Gisli greeted him warmly and offered to give him anything he wanted from his wares. The two men struck up a conversation. Gisli soon heard from Thord that he was having trouble with a forest-dwelling man who was causing him harm. "'It seems that you will have trouble with Draugr,' said Gisli, "'unless you drive him away. Unfortunately, I must be too far away next winter to give you any help.' Thord replied that he hadn't tried to rid himself of Draugr yet because many people thought it was impossible to get close to him. Gisli scoffed, saying he had faced much greater challenges in his campaigns with King Knut the Mighty and in the Western Seas, where he was always seen as a force to be reckoned with. Only let me come within reach of him, and I will trust myself and my armour, he boasted. Thord was intrigued, but warned Gisli that he couldn't just kill Draugr for free. There's a sizable bounty on his head, Thord explained. First it was six marks of silver, and this summer Thorir of Gard upped the reward to nine. People think that whoever takes him down will have had enough trouble for one lifetime. Gisli agreed that money was a powerful motivator, especially for traders like themselves. However, he warned Thord to keep their conversation hushed up, so as not to alert Draugr to their plans. Gisli revealed that he planned to be at Oldurig that winter, and wondered if Thord knew of any of Draugr's hideouts on the way there. He won't expect us, Gisli said and I won't take many men with me to attack him. Thord's proposal was approved, and he rode back home quietly, 
keeping the news to himself. As the saying goes, off in the woods is a listener nigh. Draugr's friends in Hitadal overheard the conversation and reported it to him accurately. When Draugr met Kronz, he informed him of the news and suggested that they injure Thord without killing him. Kronz grinned but said little. As the time for gathering cattle neared, Kronz travelled to Fleistjuverfi to get some sheep. The Bondis heard of his arrival and followed him. When Kronz reached the foot of the mountain and tried to drive the sheep away from him, the Bondis confronted him. There were six of them, and they stood across his path, blocking the way. Kronz became concerned about his sheep, and when he got angry, he seized three of them and threw them down the hill, leaving them senseless. The remaining Bondis half-heartedly attacked Kronz, and he took the sheep, fastened them together by the horns, threw two over each shoulder, and carried them off to his den. Gisli stayed with his ship until it was ready to be hauled up that autumn. Several things delayed him, so he was late in leaving and rode off just before the winter nights. He travelled north and stayed at Haraun on the south bank of the Hitara. The morning after he arrived, before he rode out, he told his servants, Now we will ride in red clothes and let the forest man know that we are not like the other travellers who beat about here every day. Three men came riding from the south as Kronz woke up to a cold and snowy morning. Their clothes and shields glimmered in the light as they crossed the Hitara River. Kronz recognized them and thought he'd relieve them of their belongings. He grabbed his weapons and hurriedly went down the hillside. Gisli and his men spotted Kronz running towards them. They decided to act boldly and have some fun with the man who seemed so self-assured. Kronz lay hands on a bag of clothes that Gisli had and said, I must have this. I often stoop to little things. Gisli retorted, You shall not. Do not you know with whom you have to do? Kronz replied, No, that is not so clear to me. Nor do I make much difference between one man and another since I claim so little. Not so fast, said Gisli. It may seem little to you, but I'd sooner part with thirty hundred ells of Vodmal. It seems extortion is your way. Go for him, boys. Let us see what he can do. They followed Gisli's order, and Kronz stepped back a little, reaching a stone by the side of the road called Gretishaf, where he stood at bay. Gisli rallied his men forward with vigour, but Kronz noticed that Gisli wasn't as brave as he made himself out to be. Instead, he trailed behind his men. Kronz grew tired of being boxed in and lunged with his sword, striking down one of Gisli's soldiers. Kronz sprung from his stone and assaulted them with such vigour that Gisli and his men retreated all the way down the foot of the hill. One by one, Gisli's men were killed, leaving Gisli to confront Kronz alone. One could scarcely see that you have accomplished anything in your travels abroad, and you have shamefully abandoned your comrades, Kronz taunted. Gisli replied, The fire is hottest for those who are in it. It is a bad idea to deal with men from hell. They exchanged blows, but then Gisli threw down his arms and bolted, with Kronz trailing behind him. Every chance he got, Gisli discarded another article of clothing in an attempt to escape Kronz. Though Kronz followed, he kept enough distance between them. Gisli ran without stopping until he crossed Kaldardal, past Aslaug's cliff, beyond Kolbeinstad, and finally out to Borgaraun. By then, he had only his shirt remaining, and he was completely drained of energy. Kronz persisted in following Gisli, staying within reach the whole time. Kronz stopped and took a large branch nearby, and Gisli asked if he could go free. You won't understand what I'm about to do, so I need to give you something to remember it by, said Kronz. He pulled up Gisli's shirt over his head and whipped him soundly. Gisli struggled, but Kronz gave him a beating and then let him go. Gisli had learned a valuable lesson, one that he wished he never had to learn again. He'd rather remain ignorant than face another beating like the one he'd just received from Kronz. He vowed to not do anything that would earn him another punishment. Once he had regained his footing, he made a beeline for a large pool and swam across the river to safety. He was completely drained by the time he reached Frosholt, an exhausted soul covered in unsightly blisters. He needed an entire week to recover before he could continue on to his home. Kronz, on the other hand, picked up everything that Gisli had tossed and brought it back home. Gisli never got his things back. Many believed that he had reaped what he had sown by boasting so haughtily. Kronz commemorated the occasion with a verse. The horse whose fighting teeth are dulled runs from the field before his foe. With many an afterthought ran Gisli. Gone is his fame, his glory lost. The following spring... Gisli was ready to embark on a seafaring journey. He vehemently prohibited anything of his from being taken south via the mountains, claiming that the devil himself lurked in the area. Therefore, during his trip southward, 
he followed along the coastline to avoid encountering Krons once again. Nobody thought much of Krons, and he vanished entirely from the sagas. Meanwhile, Krons's feud with Thord, Kolbein's son, had intensified to an all-time high. Thord tried everything he could think of to have Krons sent away or killed. When Krons had spent two winters in the snowy lands of Fagras Kogafjall and the third season arrived, he journeyed south towards Myra to visit the farm called Lykjabug. However, Krons didn't abide by the customs of the land and, without permission, took away six weathers from the farm. Continuing further down to Akra, he stole two oxen and many sheep for food before travelling up south to the Hitara River. As news of his lawless activities spread, the bondis of the land sent word to Thord at Hitarnas, requesting him to lead the charge against Krons. Thord, initially hesitant, eventually sent his son Arnor, later named Hovsbad, along with the bondis to capture Krons, and cautioned them not to let him evade capture. Messengers soon spread the word to all the farms. Meanwhile, a man named Bjarni, who lived in Jorvi and Flysjöverfi, gathered allies on the opposite side of the Hitara River. The plan was to make sure each group stayed on their own side of the river. Krons had two companions with him, one named Ajolf, a solidly built man and the son of a local bondi in Fagraskogar, and another. The chasing party consisted of about twenty men under the leadership of Thorarin from Akra and Sudovic of Lykjarbug. Krons realized he was being pursued and tried to cross the river, but he was intercepted by Arnor and Bjarni coming from the coast. However, Krons was a determined man who refused to let go of anything he had acquired possession of. He drove his animals onto a narrow point jutting out into the river, hoping to escape. The mirror men readied themselves to seize their prey, and Krons instructed his companions to protect his back. The mirror men could not launch a full-on assault, but instead chose to attack in good order. Krons wielded his short sword with both hands, making it challenging for his assailants to get hold of him. In the struggle that ensued, some of the merrymen were wounded, and others fell. The men on the other side of the river were slow in coming up since there was no ford nearby. Before long they began to retreat. Thorarin of Akrar, an aged man unable to participate in the fray, watched helplessly. After the battle, Krons and his companions faced his sons, brothers, and other men's attack. Krons realized the only option was to fight until the last moment or flee. He fought relentlessly and viciously, targeting those who seemed the bravest first. Sifjordur from Hraundal fell first, with Krons cleaving his skull down to his shoulders. Thorgils, Ingjald's son, was next, nearly cut in two by Krons's powerful strike. Krons then turned to Sholm, who tried to avenge the fallen, and sliced through his right thigh, leaving him unable to fight. Finally, he severely wounded Finbogi before Thorarin called for them to retreat. The battle had taken its toll, with ten men falling and almost all of them wounded. While Krons was heavily fatigued, he was barely wounded. The mirror men retreated, having suffered many losses. Those beyond the river arrived too late and saw the devastation of their men. Arnor, who did not risk his life in the battle, was blamed for his lack of bravery. The place where they fought was named Gretisodi. Krons and his companions were wounded and they rode back on their horses. When they reached Fagraskogar, they met a Bondi's daughter who asked for news. Krons told her everything and recited a verse to describe the battle. O oh, mighty goddess of the horned floods, the wounds inflicted upon Sifjordur are so grievous that they may never fully heal. The fate of Thorgils appears grim as his bones have been shattered, and eight others have lost their lives. And with that, Krons retreated to his sanctuary, where he would spend the winter in contemplation, Chapter 15. Renegade. The next time Draugr crossed paths with Krons, his tone was serious. He made it clear that Krons's presence was causing unrest, and that he wouldn't be able to stay much longer. You've killed people dear to me, but I've made a promise to you that I won't break while you're in my land, Draugr spoke sternly. Krons expressed regret for any offence he caused, but he couldn't let his life and safety be in jeopardy. Draugr understood, but didn't budge. Soon after, men who had lost loved ones due to Krons begged Draugr to take action, as they couldn't stand his presence any longer. Draugr promised to do something about it once winter had passed. Sholm, the son of Thorarin of Akrar, had recovered from his injury. He had married Steinan, the daughter of Hrut from Kamsnes, and was a respected man in his own right. Thorleif, Sifjordur's father from Haraundal lineage, was of great significance, with many notable descendants. 
No further meetings between Krons and the Merriman were reported while he was in the mountains. Draugr remained friendly, but some of his other friends distanced themselves from him, unhappy with his allowance of Kronz's presence, which led to no compensation for the murder of their kin. When the thing or annual assembly convened, Kronz left the Myra district and sought refuge in Borgarfjord. He solicited advice from Grimm, Thorhall's son, on his next move. Grimm, who couldn't guarantee shelter, suggested he try his luck with his friend, Halmond. Kronz stayed with him till the summer's end. In the fall, Kronz journeyed to Geitland, where he stayed till the weather improved. Then he ascended Geitland's Jokul, continuing southeast along the glacier, carrying a kettle and fuel. It's believed Halman's guidance steered Kronz to the valley, enclosed on all sides by overhanging ice. The valley had lush, grassy banks and brushwood. Hot springs emerged, and volcanic fires seemingly kept the ice at bay. A gentle stream trickled through the valley, its banks smooth and untouched. Sunlight was scarce in this hidden haven, and the vast expanse of sheep grazing upon the grassy hills seemed never-ending. They were the finest and fattest sheep he had ever laid eyes on. Kronz, a man of solitude, saw potential in this isolated paradise. He built himself a cabin with the logs he scavenged and hunted sheep for sustenance. The meat was far superior to any he had tasted before. In the valley lived a ewe with her lamb. The lamb was exceptional, with a large brown head and size greater than any other. It was the lamb that Kronz coveted, so he captured it and slaughtered it. The half-measure of suet he extracted was the finest he had ever had. The ewe, missing her lamb, would come every night to Kronz's cabin, bleating incessantly and depriving him of sleep. Kronz regretted the loss of the lamb, realizing the agony he had caused himself. At twilight, a voice would echo through the valley, signaling the gathering of the sheep, who would huddle together in a nearby shelter. Kronz believed the valley was ruled by a giant named Thorir, who had taken Kronz under his wing. It was Thorir who gave Kronz refuge, and in gratitude, Kronz named the valley after him Thorisdal. Kronz recounted that Thorir had daughters who enjoyed his company since few people ventured to the valley. Kronz remembered to tell Thorir's daughters to eat fat and liver during Lent. Winter was nothing remarkable, and Kronz became restless. He could no longer endure the mundaneness of the valley and left, heading south through the glacier until he reached the heart of Skjaldbreid from the north. There he picked up a stone, fashioned a hole in it, and said that if someone were to peer through the gap, they could see into Thorisdal. Kronz then travelled south, visiting great men along the way only to find them inhospitable to him. Finally, with no shelter, he returned north and stayed in various places. Soon after Kronz departed from Arnarvatten Heath, a man named Grimm arrived on the scene. He was the son of a widowed woman from Krop, and had, unfortunately, committed a grave deed by killing Aid of Ass, who was the son of Osland. As a consequence, he was outlawed, and had taken refuge where Kronz had previously stationed himself. To make do and survive, Grimm spent his days fishing in the lake nearby. However, Halmond, who was used to Kronz being in that area, was not thrilled to see Grimm in his place and predicted little advantage for him from his catch of fish. One day, after having successfully caught one hundred fish, Grimm returned to his hut and carefully arranged them all outside. The following morning, he was dismayed to find that every single one of the fish had disappeared. Puzzled by the bizarre disappearance, Grimm persisted, and the next day caught two hundred fish. Yet again, he found his catch missing in the morning. Determined to get to the bottom of this mystery, on the third day, he caught three hundred fish, brought them home, arranged them, and stayed up to watch over them. Peeking through a hole in his door, he spotted a man walking towards him, carrying a heavy basket. As the man began rummaging through the fish and throwing them into the basket, Grimm felt violated and furious that someone had been stealing his hard-earned fish. He resolved to confront the intruder and armed himself with his sharp axe. Just as the man was loading up his huge basket, Grimm charged out and delivered a fierce blow to his neck. The man, startled and wounded, ran frantically towards the southern hill, with Grimm hot on his heels, hoping to capture him. They journeyed southward, along the base of the Baljokul Glacier, until they reached a cave where a man entered. Inside they found a woman of towering height, yet with a notable figure. The woman greeted her father, referred to as Halmund. Exhausted, he dropped his burdens and heaved a tremendous sigh. She noticed blood on him and inquired about what had happened. In response he spoke in verse, saying, No man I see may trust his might. 
His luck and heart will fail at death. She persisted in knowing all about his adventure until he shared everything. She then committed his words to runes on a staff. He sang the Halmandak Vida, in which he recounted many exploits from his travels. The daughter recognized that Halmond was determined to not let his catch slip away. She questioned who would avenge him, as it was obvious that he was not treated with kindness. He replied that he believed Kronz would avenge him if he could, but that it would not be an easy task. The lay continued, but his strength waned, and he ceased to be upon concluding it. She mourned his loss, but Grimm approached her and provided comfort. He reminded her that all must depart when destiny calls, and that it was partly Halman's doing, as he would not allow himself to be robbed. She replied by stating that the unjust person would not prosper. The sound of his voice lifted her spirits as they sat and talked. Grimm remained in the cave for several nights, learning every inch of the terrain. Things went smoothly for them during this time. Following Halman's demise, Grimm spent the entire winter in Arnavatten Heath. Soon enough, Thorkell, the son of Ajolf, arrived on the heath and challenged Grimm to a fight. Despite the tension, the encounter ended with Grimm having the upper hand over Thorkell, but he couldn't bring himself to kill him. Thorkell then took him in, sending him abroad and providing him with the resources he needed. Both men were considered generous for their actions towards one another. Grimm became a renowned traveller, with a long and epic tale chronicling his journey. We pick up with Krohns, a traveller from the eastern fjords, who was trying to keep a low profile and avoid running into Thorir. He spent the summer wandering around Modrudal Heath and other areas, and even wound up on Reykja Heath at one point. Unfortunately for Krohns, Thorir got wind of his location on Reykja Heath and was determined to catch him. Before Krohns even realised what was happening, Thorir had already gathered his men and set out to find him. Krohns and another man were hiding out in a hill dairy off the beaten path when they saw Thorir and his crew approaching. With no time to spare, Krohns quickly came up with a plan. He suggested that they make their horses lie down inside the house, and then they waited to see what Thorir and his men would do. Thorir rode across the heath in a northerly direction, missed their hiding spot, and ended up turning back home without finding Krohns. Once the coast was clear and the group had ridden off to the west, Krohns turned to his companion and said, They won't be happy with themselves if they don't find me. You stay here and watch the horses while I go after them. It'll be a good laugh if they don't even recognize me. Despite his friend's protests, Kronz changed into a different outfit, pulled a wide hat down over his face, and grabbed a stick to complete his disguise. Then he headed off towards the group of men. When Thorir and his men saw Kronz approaching, they asked if he had seen any other riders on the heath. Without missing a beat, Kronz responded, I actually just saw the very men you're looking for. You were so close to them, they were on your left, just south of the marshes. With that, the group quickly galloped off towards the marshes, which turned out to be incredibly swampy and difficult to pass through. They spent most of the day stuck in the mud trying to drag their horses out, all the while cursing the trickster who had played such a cruel joke on them. Meanwhile, Kronz hurried back to his companion, and when they met up he recited a verse. I won't ride towards the warrior's arms. The danger is just too great. I can't face the storm of Vidri, so I'll turn my steps towards home instead. And with that, Kronz quickly made his escape, leaving behind a group of angry and frustrated men to contemplate their failure. So ended Kron's wild adventure on Rakia Heath. They galloped as swiftly as their horses could carry them towards the homestead in Gard, heading west to avoid any chance encounter with Thorir and his posse. As they approached their destination, they crossed paths with a stranger on the road, who seemed perplexed by their presence. Just then, a young woman, heavily adorned, caught their attention. Krohns inquired about her identity, and the stranger replied, informing them that she was Thorir's daughter. Without hesitation, Krohns recited a poem. Fair maiden, when your father returns, tell him, though it ill befits his pride, that I passed his dwelling with only these two. From this he may draw his own conclusions. With that the stranger was enlightened, and he raced off to inform the homestead of Krohns's arrival. When Thorir arrived, Many of his men believed that he had been outsmarted by Kronz. Out of fear, he ordered his spies to keep a close eye on Kronz's every move. Kronz, knowing he was being watched, sent his companion further west with his horse. He himself travelled north, deep into the mountains, concealing his face from recognition. Many assumed that Thorir suffered an even greater defeat than in their previous encounter.